Hello folks, this is my first lecture on kinetics and today we do not have assistant, an assistant but we do have Henrietta the chicken. Henrietta, we are going to learn about kinetics today. <laughs> Alright, um, so we have studied before um, thermodynamics which teaches us about um, whether a reaction will go and you find out your Gibbs free energy and if it's negative then that means it's spontaneous and um, all of that is thermodynamics and that's going to tell us uh, whether it is favorable for a reaction to go in the forward direction um, and we've also just come off of a kind of a long study of equilibrium which tells us how much will it go sure it's got a tendency to go but is it going to go all the way or is it going to kind of land somewhere in the middle and reach an equilibrium, equilibrium state? The study of kinetics is to study how fast does it go um, and what is it exactly that happens during the reaction um, uh, in terms of what are the things that the molecules are doing. So um, the basic idea behind what happens during a reaction is um, the molecules in order to react with one another must collide um, and so one of the main uh, concepts is uh, collisions and whether or not a collision is um, a successful collision or just kind of a pathetic bouncing off um, type of collision so <clears throat> you've got say two reactants and for them to react with one another um, they are bouncing around and when two of when one reactant hits the other reactant and they strike each other that um, in at that point they can react if they're separated physically they can't react with one another um, the thing about this collision is that the collision has to have um, a sufficient amount of energy for the reaction to occur so if you've got some really cold molecules which would um, make them travel more slowly uh, and they collide they can collide and just go and bounce off of each other and that collision didn't provide enough energy for the reaction to occur and the amount of energy that's required for that reaction is called the activation energy um, and you're familiar with activation en energy aren't you Henrietta um, because we studied it last year um, and when you have got a little graph of the energy as a reaction goes along if you've got say one that starts low and ends up high you'll remember that this is an endothermic form uh, type of reaction where you start with reactants that in their bonds they have um, a low amount of energy so they're pretty stable and the products contain a higher amount of energy in their bonds and so in order to get from reactants to products you get to increase the total amount of energy that's in this uh, in the uh, species but you've also got this hill and the hill is um, called the activation energy and the reason that you've got a hill is because um, of the mechanism of the reaction what's happening is um, the the reactants have to strike one another and create something called an activated complex or a transition state which is um, a very briefly existing um, species that is kind of in between the reactants and the products and it's when the bonds are beginning to break uh, from the reactants and the bonds are beginning to form from the products so this is a very unstable state it's a very brief state um, and in order to get it into that unstable brief state you need a lot of energy to bump it up there so that state the highest energy state the um, transition state has more e requires more energy than the products do so you've got to kind of go up and get over this hill and then you can land on the amount of energy where the products are um, and the that the energy required to create the the transition state is often what prevents a reaction from going um, because you've got to get up higher than you would expect so um, 
And yeah, why is there an activation energy? Because you got to break those bonds. That requires energy to get up to the products. And the unstable intermediate itself has, uh, requires more energy even than the, the products do. So um, these graphs are really important. You'll be required to analyze these this kind of graph here. Um, and uh, on the x-axis here, you've kind of got the reaction pathway or the progress of the reaction over time. Um, and on the left, you have the potential energy of the different species um, on the, sorry, on the y-axis. Um, and in this, you need to be able to figure out that this is an endothermic reaction because it goes up overall from low to high. Um, this is your delta H because that's the change in energy between the beginning and the end. And then the hump here is uh, the amount of energy required uh, to get from here to here because you got to get over this hill, the activation energy hill. All right. Um, and here's another graph with uh, an actual example um, where your reactants are, uh, your reactants are, do we need two of them? Yeah, you do. Um, a, a BRNO. Two of those have to strike one another. And when they strike one another, what's going to happen is that the BRs are going to begin um, to form bonds between the two BRs and the BRs are going to begin to break their bonds between the NOs. But in the meantime, you've got this really crazy high energy transition state uh, chemical, which is um, two NOs and two BRs all attached together. And that's a very unstable compound that requires a lot of energy to get up there. And that's what this energy of activation is, is the energy required to get to this situation, which is the situation that's required to be able to get down to the products, which are two NOs, which these guys are breaking off, right, with these bonds breaking, and um, the Br2, which is these guys forming this bond. So that's the transition state, the high energy uh, energy of activation. So bam. All right. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. So as I said, um, the thing that affects the reaction rate is the collisions, and so you can you can think about what it is that's going to affect the number of, of collisions and what's going to um, increase the number of effective collisions. Um, so the number of effective collisions, effective collisions are those collisions that actually work as opposed to the collisions that are like um, kind of too pathetic to uh, give you enough energy. Um, so effective collisions are more common at higher temperatures for two reasons. Number one, because there are more collisions per second when it is hotter. Because when the molecules are moving slowly, they go boom, boom. But when they're moving quickly, they go boom, 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 boom. So they hit each other more frequently when it is hot. Um, the other reason that there are more effective collisions um, at higher temperatures is because of something that is explained in this graph, which I have a larger picture of here. And in this graph, um, what we have is a, uh, the y-axis here is the percentage of molecules and the x-axis is with a certain kinetic energy. So here we've got two systems, the blue system, which is some cold molecules at 20 degrees Celsius, and the red system, which is a warmer system at 30 degrees Celsius. And what they're showing here is that the cold system, this blue line, um, the majority of its molecules have got about this much kinetic energy, about it, you know, to this E here in energy. Um, whereas the red system, the majority of its molecules have got more kinetic energy than that. It's all the way up to the this beginning of this arrow here. So less average kinetic energy in the blue system, more average kinetic energy in the red system. And if you remember, average kinetic energy is temperature. And so, you know, this spot right here is the molecules have are the 20 degree spot. Yes, there are molecules with less kinetic energy and molecules with more kinetic energy, but they average out to this spot here, the 20 degree spot. Um, and with the warmer system, it's a more spread out system. When it's warmer, you have got um, a more spread out um, hump here. Um, but on average, the majority of the molecules um, the are at have got this much energy, 
and yes there are some with less and yes there are some with more and they're all bouncing around and hitting each other and so sometimes you know one of them will get struck and then it has gained energy and one of, sometimes you'll have a, a head-on collision and they'll um, you know they'll one of them will lose energy and it'll get transferred but on average you've got less energy and more energy so that's the taller more leftward blue hump and the shorter more rightward red hump here all right so this other part of the graph, what we have here is this spot right here, about halfway through this arrow, is the amount of energy that would be required to reach the transition state. Um, so any molecules that have got more energy than this have got enough energy when they collide to react. Um, and so that's gonna be this whole segment of the blue system, this little pink triangle. Um, whereas with the red system, it's this whole triangle here. Now that's a bigger triangle. Um, and it's not really a triangle, it's kind of swoopy. But the um, point is, because the red system is shifted right, um, you end up with a larger number of collisions, a number of molecules with sufficient energy to react when it's warmer when they collide, and a lower proportion of molecules with sufficient energy to react when it's colder. That's in addition to the fact that there are more collisions anyway when it's hotter. So there's kind of a double reason why higher temperature results in a higher reaction rate. All right, another thing that um, affects how, if, how fast your reaction is going to go is the concentration of the reactants. Um, and this is related to the mechanism and we are going to study this one very thoroughly. Um, we're going to figure out precisely how mathematically the concentration is related to the rate of the reaction for each reactant. Some reactants when you increase their concentration will increase the rate linearly. Some reactants when you increase their concentration will increase the rate exponentially. And sometimes you can increase the uh, concentration of a reactant and it doesn't stink and matter. Um, and so we're going to look into that and, and all of the mathiness related to that. But most basically, generally, when you increase the concentration of the reactants, they hit each other more. There's more of them. There's more hitting. There are more collisions. Um, and the collisions that you need are precisely the collisions that will lead to the transition state. And so it is, uh, this is related to the mechanism uh, of how the reaction goes, exactly what goes on, what intermediates are formed, um, what bonds break in what order, that kind of thing. Um, when you increase the concentration, you're increasing the collisions that are necessary for this thing to go forward, and, and you need to understand the mechanism um, in order to figure out what collisions hap need to happen in what order. Um, and as I was saying, we're going to learn more about the math of this. Um, we're going to learn about the rate laws and specifically the differential rate law. And then later we're going to learn about the integrated rate law and it's all related and um, it's going to be great. You're going to love it. Yes. Um, so <clears throat> as I was saying, uh, the concentration is important in some reactions. Not all reactions will go faster if you increase the concentration. Most of them will but not all of them. Um, and uh, another thing that you can change um, that effectively changes the concentration is changing the volume. If you suddenly, um, if you're having a reaction going on in a balloon or something with some gases and you suddenly increase the volume of the balloon by like stretching it out or making the piston bigger or whatever it is, um, that can um, suddenly change the concentration. It can suddenly lower the concentration if you made the balloon bigger. And um, what's going to happen is those molecules aren't going to hit e each other as often. And so your rate is going to um, decrease if you increase your volume. Um, so let's see. Hotter makes it go faster. Higher concentration usually makes it go faster. Sometimes it can go faster linearly. Sometimes it can go faster exponentially. Um, sometimes it doesn't go faster at all when you increase the concentration and that's crazy and we'll figure out why later. Um, and then the other thing that really matters is the orientations. Um, and this is kind of a cool uh, idea. Uh, no, I, I wait, what? Whoop, whoop. I'm just supposed to scroll down to go to the back. Um, when the molecules hit each other, they got to hit the right sides. Um, 
you've got to have two heads hit, not a head and a tail or two tails. So here's an example. Um, here we've got um, a reaction between nitrogen monoxide and nitrogen trioxide, which when they react, um, they will form two nitrogen dioxides. Um, and what you're going to end up with is um, these molecules bouncing around and kind of randomly hitting each other. So this is the nitrogen trioxide here um, with the nitrogen being blue and the oxygens being red. And on the left you've got the nitrogen monoxide. And so what it's showing here, and let's do the effective one first. Um, here's the nitrogen monoxide with the nitrogen of that nitrogen monoxide coming from the left swooping in and the nitrogen trioxide coming from the right swooping to the left and what they're doing when this is an effective when this is an effective collision is the nitrogen of the nitrogen of this guy and one of the oxygens of this guy will strike that is the collision that will allow a bond to begin forming between this nitrogen and this oxygen and this bond to be to begin breaking and then it will kind of go boop and pop over that's what's going to work. It's not going to work if, let's go through all of the ways it's not going to work, if this oxygen hits this oxygen. Because what are they going to do? Bond together? That doesn't actually help. It doesn't get us towards this situation. It doesn't help if this um, oxygen hits this nitrogen because this nitrogen is already sort of overwhelmed. He doesn't need them. It's this nitrogen that wants more. What if this nitrogen hits this nitrogen? Well, do you want to form a bond between those two nitrogens? We're not trying to get two nitrogens together. Um, it's not going to work if um, kind of the middle of this dude hits this oxygen. The only collision that's actually going to work is the nitrogen of the left guy hitting an oxygen of the right guy. And so you can see that of all of the bouncing that's going on, only a small fraction of the collisions that have a, the correct amount of energy are going to be effective um, because they've got to strike each other in the right orientations. Um, so you got to have a good angle. Um, nope. Dang it. This way. All right. So that is orientations. Um, and strangely, you may remember a dude named Arrhenius. Do you remember what he's from? Acids. That's correct. Good job, Henrietta. Um, Arrhenius also did some work with um, rates of reaction and orientations. And here's his equation, which what it's saying is K, which is your rate. Um, and one thing that's important to notice is that didn't we just have a K in equilibrium? That was a capital K. This is a lowercase k, and this k is the um, rate constant um, and that rate constant is equal to um, well the things that matter are the activation energy you gotta have the gas constant in there and because this is energy related it's the um, 8.3145 your temperature matters and then the other thing that matters is the frequency factor um, which is kind of a a fraction of the, it's it's a number that represents the fraction of collisions that um, are good orientation. So um, in the example that we had before, it looked like um, about a fifth of the collisions would be the right direction and kind of there were uh, four fifths that would be lousy directions. So that's what the A for that reaction would be. It's different for each reaction kind of depending on how uh, how many surfaces will will work uh, striking each other. So. Um, more complicated molecules would have a smaller uh, frequency factor because there'd be so many more ways in which they could strike wrong than ways they could strike right. Um, one thing that's great about this Arrhenius equation is that we don't have to super use it very much. Yay! Um, but one use that is made of the Arrhenius equation is um, making a graph of it. And But this looks so <clears throat> but this looks very ugly for a graph. Yeah, I agree. Um, but if you take the ln of both sides, what you end up with is um, something that is actually in the y equals mx plus b form. Um, and it ends up being, let's see, um, I don't think they're going to let me write on this. Um, it ends up being ln of k equals... Um, 
negative activation energy over RT plus ln of A. And uh, the negative activation energy over RT, that ends up being your, um, that ends up uh, being your slope, the M X plus B. Um, so you can basically graph the thing and then take the slope and figure out what the activation energy is. Um, and so uh, you can in lab actually calculate K, which is a thing that you can do, um, do some graphing and then figure out your activation energy. And I think I'll, I'll show you an example of that at some point, um, but we're not going to do that right now. Um, and there's that. Arrhenius equation. Next, catalysts. Um, we've talked about catalysts before. Catalysts are important in kinetics because they are one way in which you can make a reaction go faster. Um, and we didn't we didn't hit this very specifically last year, but the reason that catalysts make a reaction go faster is because the catalyst provides a different um, mechanism for the reaction to happen. And the different mechanism is a mechanism that requires a lower amount of activation energy. So I'm going to go and look at this graph more closely so that it's more visible. Um, you, 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 come here. All right. So here we have an example of a reaction where the reactants have got this much energy and the products have got this much energy. So that's higher energy to lower energy. So this is an exothermic reaction. Um, but again, you've still got the hill. So typically, um, you would have to have a collision that provided this much energy. You get stuck. This much energy in order to reach the energy required to um, make the uh, intermediate. And uh, then that thing can kind of break apart and fall down and make the products releasing a bunch of energy. So this is kind of a big activation energy hill, which means that you're going to be waiting a while because you have to wait for the molecules to happen to strike each other with the right amount of energy. Um, when you put a catalyst in, it allows you to have that reaction happen without making this particular transition state. It gives you another option. It gives you a transition state that has a lower amount of energy. Um, and so you can just wait for the collisions to have this much energy. That's going to happen much more frequently than this much energy. So you can just go, woo, smaller activation energy. So that means that that's going to happen a lot faster because you, you've got a different pathway um, when you use a catalyst. Um, the thing to remember about a catalyst is that it doesn't get used up by the reaction. It can be modified during the reaction, but at the end of the reaction, it's got to get put back into its original state because otherwise you'll put in some catalyst and it'll, it'll get used up immediately and then, well, you made like the first three molecules go faster, but whoop de doo now you're waiting uh, around for this high energy thing. A catalyst doesn't get eaten up. Um, so even if it gets modified during the reaction, it gets reformed at the end. Um, so we'll take a look at some of thing, uh, the things that that happens with as well. All right. Um, all right, so the mechanism. Like we were saying, um, the linear versus uh, the linear versus the exponential thing um, that I was talking about. This is this is um, related to the mechanism. This is precisely what happens. Um, what happens during the reaction itself? It's not like, bam, you went straight from reactants to products. Something actually happens. Some. Uh, there are collisions, things have to hit in the right orientation, some bonds begin to break, some bonds begin to form, um, and it's important to know um, exactly what the steps are um, because if you know the steps, you can understand more about how to make the thing go faster. Um, and of the, uh, when you kind of list out the steps, what's important to figure out is which one of those steps is the slowest step, the one that you get bogged down in, the one that you're waiting on. Um, it's called the slow step and it's also called the rate determining step. Because if you have a fast step, a fast step, a really, really slow step, a fast step and a fast step, the thing that you're waiting on is the slow step. 
yeah, the fourth and fifth step that were fast, eh, kind of. But really, the thing that you're kind of sitting around waiting and staring at your watch for is that slow step. Um, so, um, you need to learn this word, which is molecularity, which is pretty great, which is how many molecules must simultaneously collide in order for something to react. Um, so, when we're talking about a mechanism, you're dealing with steps which are basically collisions that you're waiting for to happen. And each of those types of collisions can be described as either unimolecular, which means that what you're waiting for is basically nothing. You're just waiting for one molecule to bust into two. So that's, um, that is a unimolecular step. A bimolecular step is you're waiting for two molecules to strike one another. That might be molecule A striking molecule B and that will make a product, or you might be waiting for molecule A to hit another molecule A to make a product. So that would be, these are bimolecular steps. Um, and um, a ter-molecular step, which I think is a great word, is you're waiting around for three molecules to simultaneously strike each other with perfect orientation. Ter-molecular steps are really slow, typically, because how likely is it that those three will strike each other exactly right? Pretty, pretty dang unlikely. Um, you might have a termolecular step where you're waiting for A to hit to A to hit B and C simultaneously, or you might be waiting for two A's to hit a B simultaneously, or you might be waiting for three A's to hit simultaneously. Doesn't really matter, um, but those are all termolecular steps. So this is this is kind of the a fast kind of step, the unimolecular step. A slowish kind of step would be a bimolecular step, and a really dang slow step would typically be a termolecular step. Um, and the rate law that you're going to run across um, for these different kinds of steps are, um, and this is typically going to be the rate equals um, the rate constant, which just fixes the units and, and stuff, times the concentration of A, which what that means is if you increase the concentration of A, that will make the rate go faster. Okay. Um, and it's going to increase it in a linear way. So if you double A, you'll double rate. If you triple A, you'll triple rate. Um, because the rate constant is always the same number. When you get to a step that's a bimolecular step, um, you can do the same kind of thing. If you've got the rate equals K times the concentration of A times the concentration of B, um, if you double A, that will double the rate. If you double A and you double B, that's double and double, you will quadruple the rate. If you've got this kind of bimolecular step with you've got two A's where A matters twice, you end up with rate equals K times A squared, where that way, if you double A, you quadruple the rate. And so you end up with doubling the concentration exponentially increases your rate. Um, so that's kind of a cool uh, kind of deal there. So with a unimolecular step, doubling A increases rate linearly. With a bimolecular step where you've got two A's hitting each other, doubling A will increase the rate exponentially. This lends itself to doing stuff in lab because what you can do is you can measure how fast the reaction is going, then double A, and you can check and see, did, when I doubled A, did it linearly increase the rate or did it exponentially increase the rate? And that's going to give you an insight into the mechanism, which you can't really figure out any other way. Um, you, you can figure out by you know, fiddling with the concentrations and seeing what the, react, what the um, response is with the rate. Um, and then with these difficult term molecular steps here, um, you can have, um, you know, rate equals K times A times B times C, um, or I like, uh, this one is sort of more mentally helpful, rate equals K times A cubed. Because what you're waiting for is three A's to hit each other simultaneously. That's going to take a while. <laughs> Um, but if you double A, that's going to be real. If you double the concentration of A, if you just increase it, double it, um, you're really going to increase your chances because you've doubled this thing that you're waiting on, you've doubled this thing that you're waiting on, you've doubled this thing that you're waiting on. So A matters three times. If you've doubled it, that's going to cube your concentration. So that's really neat. Um, 
that means that you can have um, a great effect on increasing the rate of a reaction with a term molecular step um, as the slow step. Um, and remember again, you know, what we care about is the molecularity of the slowest step. The fast steps, eh, whatever, increasing the concentration of the things that are in the fast steps doesn't really help you because the one that you're waiting on is the slow step. So here's an example. You have this reaction. You've got nitrogen dioxide reacting with carbon monoxide. And when they react, you're going to make nitrogen monoxide and carbon dioxide. So basically you've taken one of these O's and shoved it over onto carbon dioxide. Um, what they've done is that in lab, it's got to be experimentally determined. What they've done is they've kind of looked around, they doubled nitrogen dioxide and it increased the rate exponentially. They're like, oh, so my rate law is rate equals K times NO2 squared. What you can tell from this rate law is that the slow step that we were wondering what the slow step of this uh, mechanism was, the slow step involves NO2 to an exponential degree. And so knowing that information, a scientist proposed, maybe this is the mechanism for what exactly happens. Maybe what happens is two nitrogen dioxides hit each other. And what that makes is nitrogen trioxide and nitrogen monoxide. And then that nitrogen trioxide that you just made comes down and in this fast step, that nitrogen trioxide strikes the, nit the carbon monoxide here. And then you get the nitrogen dioxide and carbon dioxide. Um, and so what you end up doing is you, you have to check and make sure that everything cancels out properly so that the slow step, you got two NO2s, um, but this NO2 and this NO2 end up canceling. This is a um, reactant that gets reformed as a product. So cancel, cancel. And then this is a intermediate um, that gets consumed as a reactant in the second step. So that's cancel, cancel. So you do end up um, reforming this, um, no, you do end up actually carrying out this reaction as it's shown, NO2 plus CO yields NO plus CO2. But what you would naively think is happening is this oxygen is just hopping over onto this carbon monoxide. That's not what, that is not the mechanism for this reaction. You've got something much more complicated going on, two steps where you make an intermediate and then you consume the intermediate. Um, and what's important is the slow step, which is really what's going to determine your rate of reaction involves waiting around for two nitrogen dioxides to strike each other. And you're going to see that in lab in the sense that when you double the rate of your nitrogen dioxide, that's going to exponentially increase your rate. But if you double the concentration of carbon monoxide and you're thinking, oh, this is going to go faster now, it doesn't. Because the rate law that you found in lab, the experimentally determined rate law, um, is that carbon monoxide increasing doesn't do um, uh, bupkis for increasing the rate. The only thing that increases the rate is increasing the concentration of your NO2, which gives you, and, and that's exponential, which gives a scientist enough information to say, well, then maybe this is the mechanism. Um, and for a scientist to make that kind of proposal, um, they've got to, um, make sure of the following couple of things. The mechanism has to match the balanced equation. Um, you can't propose a mechanism uh, that creates, for example, nitrogen trioxide and then leaves it there. If you're creating an intermediate, it's got to be consumed because, you know, if it was still there, it would show up in the balanced equation. So it, you've got to make sure that the things that you have proposed cancel out to um, match the balance equation. The other thing that you've got to make sure of when you're going to propose a mechanism based on what you've learned from your rate law is it's, um, it's got to match the experimentally determined rate law. So, you know, experimentally in lab, you've doubled NO2 and you found that it's exponentially increased your rate. That means that you have to propose a mechanism where the slow steps involve nitrogen dioxide exponentially. So nitrogen dioxide, here's a bimolecular step of nitrogen dioxide being the slow step. That matches this. 
you wouldn't be allowed to propose, um, for example, our naive uh, thing. You, ca you can't propose that, well, nitrogen dioxide strikes a carbon monoxide and the O just transfers over because that would give you a totally different rate law. That would give you rate equals K, NO2, and CO because then it would matter the concentration of carbon monoxide and it would matter the concentration of nitrogen, nitrogen dioxide only linearly. So you have to propose a mechanism where this is exponential and that this mechanism does that. Um, so for, the, for example, um, if you had this reaction, 2NO2F2 yields 2NO2F. Um, so you could look at this and go, okay, so let's propose something. Um, with, before we look at anything else, I just think they hit each other. Okay, um, and then that'll do it. So um, we need to go and see if that makes any sense. So let's go look at the rate law that has been experimentally determined. The rate law says your rate is uh, your rate constant times the concentration of NO2 and the concentration of F2. So what this is saying is that in the mechanism our slow step is going to involve the concentration of NO2 linearly and the concentration of F2 linearly. Um, so let's see if somebody proposed this mechanism. Let's see if this one makes any sense. Um, here's our slow step, and what our slow step is doing is we're waiting for NO2 to strike F2. And hey, that does make sense. This is a bimolecular slow step with NO2 striking F2, and that's what you would kind of expect from this rate law. So, so far we're good. That matches the experimentally determined rate law. Let's also make sure that it matches the balanced equation, so let's cancel any intermediates and see if we end up back with this thing. So. Let's see, this makes an, a single fluorine and that single fluorine is consumed. So that cancel, cancel, and you've made one of the products. And then the second NO2 is used up. So that does make sense. It's showing one NO2 striking F2, one of the Fs falls off and leaves you with your first product NO2F then that F that fell off will then go and strike another NO2 and that will rapidly form an NO, a second NO2F. So when you cancel all this out it does re-give you this reaction and your slow step matches your rate law. So this, this proposed mechanism could be correct. Now here's the thing, that's as far as you can go because there is often more than one mechanism that matches both the rate law and the equation. Um, and so oftentimes scientists are kind of left with, well, we've come up with a couple that might be right. And um, a, a lot of times what ends up happening is um, some graduate student's uh, project is, can you go do a whole bunch more science to figure out which one of these proposed mechanisms, both of which we think could be it, is actually it. And so they'll go do some crazy thing where, um, they'll try and prove, for example, uh, that F is an intermediate. Um, so maybe they'll figure out some way to sort of trap it and prove that it used to, that it was present. So um, that's something that we're not going to get into, but that um, chemists are doing a lot of. Pew, pew, pew. Um, another proposed mechanism, so for example, maybe this is the other one that could be, uh, uh, that could be true, is um, a lot more complicated. Here we've got four steps, the first of which is slow and the last three of which are fast. Um, so let's see if this one matches. Um, in our slow step, which is the one that matters, we need to make sure that our rate law matches it. So our rate law says that NO2 and F2 matter linearly and in our slow step, that is a case. So, so far we have matched the experimentally determined rate law. We've got this bimolecular slow step that matches here, bam. What we end up making is supposedly NOF2 and one of the O's falls off instead of in our other mechanism, somebody proposed that an F fell off, okay. And then they're saying this O would then go and strike another NO2 and make NO3, oh good heavens. And then let's say that NO3, oh, the NO3 has to wait around a little bit because they're proposing that an NOF, this NOF2 that we made is going to strike an NO2 
and make an NO2F, finally making one of our products, and another intermediate NOF, and now NOF, this intermediate, can go strike this other intermediate from before and make the second product, NO2F, and an NO2. Well, that's this NO2 cancels out this NO2, this NO2 and this NO2 and this F2, and I think everything cancels out properly. This one is going to take a lot of canceling. I would like you to go and check and make sure that all of your intermediates cancel away and any extra products or reactants cancel away as well, and that this actually regenerates this reaction. Um, it does match the rate law, but I don't really feel like doing all that canceling. So now that's your job. All right, next, we've got just a little bit more, just a little bit of graph explaining here. All right, here we've got a graph um, and what it's showing, this is kind of a really close up look of um, a mechanism happening. And what we've got is um, CH3Br and um, hydroxide. And what they're saying is that here are your reactants and then as they strike each other, as they approach, you're going to for start forming this bond and start breaking this bond. This is your transition state. This is a very unstable state and it requires a lot of energy to get up to this state because um, it's just, it doesn't last very long. It's unhappy there. Um, once you've gotten up to enough energy to get you there though, then it's happy enough to go all the way back down this hill. So this bond finishes forming, this bond finishes breaking, and you can finally get down to the bottom of the hill. So this is the mechanism for the reaction between, um, what is this called? Uh, bromoethane, I think. No, bromomethane um, and uh, hydroxide. Um, and they're showing this is a exothermic reaction and here's your uh, energy of activation, your activation energy, um, and here is your delta H um, which is going to be negative because you're releasing energy here. Um, and um, another thing that's interesting uh, about mechanisms is that often you think that a mechanism is going to be similar to a different mechanism because hey it's basically the same process but they, they can be sort of crazy different. So what we just saw was one reaction of a uh, brominated um, organic compound with hydroxide. Here are a couple other ones. Um, here we've got um, uh, two-bromo, two two-methylpropane, which means we've got propane and a methyl on one side and a bromo on the other. And it's reacting with hydroxide to make um, CH3, COH, and uh, bromide. And what they're saying is that the rate um, is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of basically only your big reactant here, the 2-bromo-2-methylpropane. So what that means is that the slow step doesn't involve hydroxide at all. And so what we're seeing is they're saying, you just kind of wait around until the electrons in this bond happen to go visit bromine more than they do chlor uh, carbon. So you're just waiting and waiting and waiting and then finally those electrons get close enough to um, bromine that this bond just randomly breaks. That takes a while. You're waiting and waiting and waiting. So that's your slow step and that's why this is in this rate law here. And then once that has happened and this bromide has just fallen off and gone off, you leave, you're left with a carbon that has a positive charge. At that point, you're going to have a fast step which involves the negatively charged hydroxide with these electrons on that oxygen going, ooh, a positive thing, bam, fast. And you've uh, generated this um, this product. So that's your mechanism for true bromo 2 methylpropane reacting with hydroxide. But you can have a different mechanism than that. You could you could have instead this reaction, which is bromoethane, which has only got the two carbons instead of the four from ab above, reacting with hydroxide. And you'd think, oh, well, you're probably just going to do exactly the same thing where you're waiting around for the electrons to happen to land on the bromine. That's not what you find in your... Um, in your rate law, what you see in your rate law, which you determine in lab by saying, by doubling this and you go, oh, the rate doubled. And then you double hydroxide and the rate doubled. And you're like, oh, hydroxide is involved in my slow step? Huh, it is because in this mechanism, what's happening is the hydroxide will come along and collide. And that collision of this negative thing with this positive thing 
causes the electrons to hop onto the bromine and the bromine falls off. Where before you were just waiting for it to happen on its own, now you've got this hydroxide that's coming over and kind of kicking it. Um, so this is a different mechanism and you're like, but why is it different? And that gets into the difference of structure and the difference of electronegativity and all of the stuff that you have to take into account that it, it, if you were going to be the scientist that proposed mechanisms. That is not our job. Our job is simply to look at a reaction and a rate law and given a propo proposed mechanism, we can tell them if they're off their rocker or not and say, that wouldn't work at all. Um, it doesn't match this or it doesn't match this. Um, so that is our situation and that is all I have to say. And I will be back um, next time to talk about the differential rate laws um, and more about them. Bye.